All right. Welcome to another episode. Welcome, everyone. Today, I have another special guest with me, Brian Berletic, um, who does a lot of commenting online about the political landscape, geopolitics, uh, uh, a lot of overlap with some of the stuff that I talk about. And I'm rediscovering some of your work uh, because, and we'll talk about this in a bit, you, you were using a pen name before, and I'm starting to realize now that some of the articles that I really enjoyed before was actually your work. Um, but before we get um, too deep into this, um, what we're going to do, it, this is just kind of on the fly. We decided we were going to meet today uh, online and uh, get to know each other a little bit, uh, keeping it casual. Towards the end of the conversation, I've got a little bit of a, I guess you could say a surprise. It's a clip um, who put this uh uh, the best thing I could say is a hot takeout, which is just really kind of um, entertaining. Uh, it's from some sort of another, uh, uh, an alternate dimension. I really hope you haven't seen it yet so I can get your reaction firsthand. But before we get into any of that, um, how about you just introduce yourself uh, to my audience? I'm going to guess a lot of them probably already know you, but uh, why don't you go ahead first? So my, my name is Brian Berletic. I'm an American uh, I joined the U.S. Marine Corps when I was 17 years old, like just, just a couple of days out of high school. Um, and I, I was stationed mostly in Japan. My specialty was electro-optical ordnance repair. So I, I worked on advanced weaponry. And I, I was never going to go into combat, but um, I, what, what I was seeing all around me, I, you know, it's kind of woke me up. I was very patriotic. I thought I was fighting for freedom and, and defending my country by, by being overseas in Japan somehow. And, uh, you know, just a little thing here and there started to kind of open my eyes. And then eventually I had like a, just like a light bulb go off. And I, I realized what I was doing was totally wrong. And uh, when, when the, this was between 2000 and 2003, and this was right before uh, the US invaded Iraq. And I was totally against that war. I got out like maybe six months before my contract was up because it was a four year contract. And, uh, you know, my, my command even said, Berletic, why don't you just wait six months? You could get your benefits. It's not like you're ever going to go to combat or anything, but it was just something that I, I really felt strongly about. And I felt so strongly about it that I didn't even want to live in the US. When I got back home, you know, I explained to my family what I was thinking and I, I left and I went to Thailand. And I, I've been there ever since, like 17, 18 years, something like that. I spent almost a year in Singapore. I did go back one time to the U.S. just to visit my family. And then I came back. That was around 2007, I think. And that's uh, I, I took a trip back from the U.S. by sea, over land and sea. And I, I actually passed through China. I went from Shanghai to Kuoming. Uh, and then from Kuoming through Lao to Thailand, it was, I mean, it was eye opening. I, I, I was already kind of waking up politically throughout that whole period. And then 2010, 2009, 2010 is when I started to, to write because I was here in Thailand and I thought I'm on the other side of the planet. Uh, you know, I'm as far away from the U.S. as possible, but the U.S. was still interfering. They were interfering here. There were protests out in the streets, violent protests and were armed militants involved. And I watched the BBC and Reuters and AP and all of them go out into the streets and, and watch the armed violence and then go back to their newsroom and write articles about how the, the Thai military was cracking down on unarmed protesters. And this, this is what started me writing because I just couldn't stand it anymore. And I felt the need that I uh, to kind of balance the narrative. And it, it seems like such a futile uphill climb, but you just do it every day every day over the years. So that was 2010. And I've been writing ever since. And I got over something like 2000 articles out there. And now I started doing videos. Um, because I like you said, I was writing under a pen name, actually a couple of pen names, Tony Cartolucci, Joseph Thomas, which are my my middle and my middle names, and Gunnar Olsen, which was like a joke from Saturday Night Live when I was in high school. <laughs> it was like a, a guy who did rock and roll uh, news or something ridiculous like that. And I, I just used these pen names because I was a prolific writer and people that wanted to publish my work didn't want, you know, Tony Cartolucci all down their, their front page. So I, I wrote under a few different names. And uh, 
I, I had to come out under my real identity. I didn't want to. I don't like doing this. I don't want credit for doing this. Um, but I had to because here in Thailand, there's there's still with the the interference and the the protests in the streets right now. This is all U.S. backed, and I was exposing this, and it was going viral here in Thailand. And the U.S. embassy twice made official statements denying that they were involved in the protests, and they mentioned an English language blog, which was obviously my blog, and also Facebook and Twitter deleted all of my accounts all on the same day. Uh, not just my Tony Cartolucci Land Destroyer, you know, I had this blog called Land Destroyer. Um, they deleted all of that, but also my personal accounts and my real name. So they definitely knew who I was. And so I felt being anonymous was no longer a form of protection. I thought, just come out publicly, let people know who I am in case anything happens, at least they'll know what happened. Uh, so that that's, probably like the last year or so I've been doing everything under my right. real name. And yeah. And there's and so much it. there I want to unpack with that uh, because um, what happened in Hong Kong was kind of my point where I started getting a lot more active also. And it was a lot of the same stuff, kind of looking at what was actually happening on the ground versus what was being covered um, and how well the narrative, the, the, the mainstream media narrative could, uh, could avoid such obvious things that were happening on the ground. I didn't really get too much into the, I, I saw when the Thai protests were happening, uh, it was like, wait, hold on, they've got all the same equipment. They got the same yellow hard hats. They got all this. It's like, what's going, it's like, there's like this care package that's unloaded to these people <laughs> in all of these different places. Yeah. And in Hong Kong, they've openly admitted they're involved um, in this kind of stuff. But before I get into uh, some of that stuff, I want to, I want to back it up a little bit because to me, I mean, that's such a, it's both a, 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 a positive and also a sad story at the same time, having everything you know about your country, I guess specifically when you're involved in it too, when you thought you were getting involved in something positive and having it just all crumble in front of you as you start to learn the truth. I mean, that must have been a really uh, emotional period of time. Uh, I, I think a lot of people probably go through that. Uh, the, the, the propaganda in America, the way that the CIA works with Hollywood movies to create this image of this great power uh, that does good things all around the world um, really does a good job of keeping people asleep. And uh, to be honest, it's way, I mean, our lives would be so much easier if we were still asleep. You know, if, you, if when you don't see this stuff yes. and you don't know what's going on, like it, it's such a burden to know this stuff and be like, oh, hold on a second, we got to say something about this. But what I want to do is I want to try to back it up a little bit to that I guess you could say an embarrassing period of our lives when we accepted a lot of the narratives at face value. H how was that happening? What was shaping your opinions? Like what kinds of ideas did you have about America? I want to hone in that, on that a little bit. Like when you joined the military, were you like, I am really doing something good for my, you know, m my country and for the world. And, you know, what went into building your perspective of the world and wh wh what were your feelings at that point in time before you kind of woke up? It was kind of a mix of different things, uh, luckily. And I, I, I'm pretty sure this was uh, the, the seeds were planted uh, by my parents and, and other people close to me who kind of said, Brian, why are you why are you joining the military? You know, they say they're doing all these things, but they're not really. And my, my, my family is kind of on the conservative side and they still warned me, you know, don't join right. the military. Don't do it. I, I didn't no, listen. What you, I, like, so yeah, so you like before you get to the point where you transition. Oh, sorry, you might you might have been already doing that. I just want to make sure. Uh, it, what I want to know is like why you didn't believe them, and what was it that went into your perspective where you're like, no, 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 this is the right thing to do. When you were, you know, uh, convinced. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to make sure we cover that part first. Yeah. So I, you know, it's just you, from the moment you're born and all throughout the, the sc your schooling and, and everything you're surrounded by with the media, you know, when you're a little kid watching G.I. Joe, I mean, you, you really think that that's the, the right thing to do. If you're, if you're a man and you're, you're able-bodied, you should go and serve your country, which, which actually you, you should, as long as your country is not, you know, going around the world doing what the United States is doing. And so, you know, that was what I was thinking. And even as my parents and, and others close to me were warning me in the back of my mind, I kind of knew they were telling the truth, but I, I guess because I was young, I was a kid, I was stubborn, I, I didn't listen to them. I, I already kind of said I was going to do this. And so I felt like I should really follow through doing it. But, but I'll tell you the the minute I got to Paris Island where, where US Marines undergo their, their basic training in South Carolina, the minute I got there, 
I realized that was not what I signed up for. When you see some of the people that show up there, uh, just so they can meet their recruitment quotas, uh, some of these people don't belong in the military. They don't belong near weapons. Uh, they don't belong part of an organization that is going to go overseas and, and potentially harm or kill people around the globe. These are not the people you, you should trust that responsibility to. And I noticed that from the very beginning, but I still stubborn and young, I, I stuck to it. Um, when I went to Japan, my first day on Okinawa, uh, where, where most of the US Marines are stationed, we, we get into this base and there's Japanese people protesting outside. And I even said out loud to someone else and they agreed to me. I, I was like, why are they protesting? We're here to protect them. You know, we're here to protect them against, you know, back, back at, at that time, China was already something a lot of people were talking about. And we're like, we, we, you know, China's gonna, could be a threat to Japan. We have to be here to protect them. But over time, you know, the way the Marines uh, treat the locals there is horrible. Every, every single, you know, I was in a small regiment, like maybe 100, 200 Marines. And every single month, someone would be in trouble for punching a local in the face or sexually assaulting uh, a, a local, maybe not rape, but, but there were rape cases as well, you know, within the, the, you know, the entire, there's like an ecosystem of bases there. It's just, it's like, a, you know, you look at Okinawa, and it's like, like tumors, you know, growing on it, these bases. And, uh, you know, over time, you, you start to learn about the Japanese people, their culture, you see how beautiful that island is, and then you start to understand that that the U.S. presence there is a blight, and it is not necessary. We're not there protecting them. We're using them as a springboard to do what we did to Japan to other people. And a lot of people, you know, Japan was not like a an innocent victim in World War II, but it was. It's not exactly the way we we think of it either. And you know, all of these things were brewing, and then 9/11 happened. And like a lot of Americans, I totally fell for it. I totally fell for the narrative. I was, I, I thought that we're gonna just blitzkrieg through the entire Middle East, the, destroy all of these countries, overthrow their governments, which is what the U.S. government wanted to do. That was, that was the whole, you know, the idea behind that. Uh, but they never sent my, my, my regiment was never going to go and I was never going to go do anything. So what, what ended up happening, I was, a, I was a big, even back then, a big student of history and Sun Tzu and the art of war. And it says, know, your, know yourself and know your enemy. And so I thought, well, if these Muslims really are such a, a big threat to the world, you know, they're these extremists, I should read the Quran myself and see what's going on. Why, where are they getting this from? When I started reading it, the actual Quran, not, not somebody's cherry picked version of it. Uh, I, I started to realize we were being lied to. They were taking these quotes out of context. They were leaving essential sentences before and after these quotes, which, which qualified it and showed that that's not what they're saying. They're not saying just go kill anyone uh, who doesn't believe or, or uh, wage war, merciless war on people. It wasn't like that at all. And so that was kind of like an aha moment, a light bulb went off. And then I kind of saw, every, like almost instantly, I started to see everything in a completely different light in the regiment command, you know, where the, the officers, commissioned officers in the US military walk those halls. They had these racist anti-Muslim propaganda posters on the wall. And I just thought, what are, what are we doing? This is insane. And this whole thing right. is insane. And, and, and then even some of the senior people around me, you know, when we're doing a field exercise or something, uh, the, we're actually at Fuji, uh, Mount Fuji, Camp Fuji, right at the base of Mount Fuji on the mainland of, of Japan when 9-11 when happened. And we, we were out in the field and I remember some of the older guys saying, no, no, we created bin Laden and now this is the, the chickens coming home to roost. And, uh, you know, like you start hearing all of these things and it starts to add up where what, what are we what is the United States doing around the globe? We're not we're not reacting. We're the ones creating these problems. We, we make a mess and then the mess snowballs. It gets bigger and bigger. And then we're, we're making messes on top of messes. That's that's what Afghanistan was. And then as soon as they started talking about Iraq, that the decision was made. But, you know, by, by myself, like I was not going to stay in any longer because 
everyone knew there wasn't going to be any, even in the military, everyone knew there weren't going to be any weapons of mass destruction long before the invasion started. And I even had uh, senior, you know, officers that I had to talk to as part of the process of me getting out. And they even said, you know, I might do the same thing if I was in your place, but I'm old. You know, I, I'm going to retire. I can't restart my life. You're young. You can, you can start over again. And so good luck to you. You know, some weren't that understanding, but some of them were. So it just goes to show you, you know, we're not imagining this. There's a lot of right. people who understand there's something wrong going on. And it's just something that has its own life, its own momentum. And a lot of people feel too small uh, to, to do anything about it, to change its course. It's it's really remarkable. When you were telling me the story about uh, arriving in Japan and being confused at people protesting, it reminded me of this video of a, a Vietnam War vet, a very um, charismatic storyteller. And he was talking about the same thing. He was expecting to going there. Like he was seeing that he was he was play, replaying the images of after World War II, the French people, you know, welcoming the Americans. And uh, when he got to Vietnam, he realized that these people didn't like them. They, they didn't want them there. And he realized that they were the ones creating more Viet Cong. They would, all you'd had to do is wait for a, um, a Marine group to go through one village. And then the Viet Cong had all the recruits they needed because of the brutality that was going on. Um, and, and that was kind of an epiphany moment for him. You know, after 9-11, that's when I started getting little inklings of kinds of things going on as well, too. I got to say, even as a Canadian, you know, I remember everybody remembers, you know, who was of a certain age, where they were when that happened. You know, I was sitting in, in the uh, in the office. I was working for a big corporation in Canada. One plane hit the building. And then uh, the, the director, uh, uh, my director came out and said, there's a plane that hit the building. And then he came out after and said, there was a second plane. This is World War III. And I was like, shit, what's going on? And uh, I've, got, I've got a lot of family in New York. I, I used to go there at least once a year. I have a cousin that works in the World Trade Center. I tried calling them over and over again, but you can imagine all the lines were jammed. You couldn't get through. Uh, like all the lines were jammed. Everybody, everybody was trying to call New York. And, uh, you know, afterwards, I, I was the same kind of way. I was like, Some, somebody needs to pay for this and somebody needs to pay hard. Um, I've got a friend here in Shenzhen also. He was working in New York when that happened. He was a high level kind of investment banker. He quit his job. He joined the military. He fought in Afghanistan. He forgot, fought in Iraq. And he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. I've drank with him a few times. That's just like an off topic thing. He doesn't want to talk about the horrors he saw. He doesn't want to talk about what he got tricked into. Um, it's just this traumatic thing. And it's the same kind of thing. He's not living in America anymore. He doesn't want to live there anymore. He's done with it. Um, what, 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 what was like, uh, really curious to me was when Ron Paul was uh, in a, in a, in a, in a debate on stage, uh, Giuliani was there too. And he was asking the question, he was like, we, we've got to ask ourselves, why did they attack us? They're not just attacking us because they hate our freedom. It's because we're over there. It's because of what we've been doing to them over and over again. And Giuliani, uh, blew up at him and was like, how dare dare you as somebody who lived through the attacks that's the most absurd thing to suggest that we invited these attacks and the entire audience cheered and i was like well, hold on a second why didn't i ever think of this question why 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 are, why, are, why are we being directed so violently away from a question of reflection and saying what what exactly happened nothing nothing that happened will excuse the loss of innocent lives in new york but to step back and just say, what exactly happened here? And to reconcile it, that was the first kind of thing where I was like, something's wrong here. But it didn't take me until like Hong Kong, uh, where I was really like, somebody's got to speak back against some of this stuff. But what I'm curious now about you is that, all right, so you go into the military, you're not listening to everybody, you think you're doing something good, then you just go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum. You're like, I'm not only done with the military, I'm done with America. What is your uh, family's reaction at that point? Are they like, well, hold on a second. We just said just take it, take it back a few notches. We're, we didn't say go all the way over there. <laughs> like, uh, what, what was the reaction from the people around you who were before thinking you were a little bit too gung-ho on this American kind of a hero kind of a thing? I, I think, you know, maybe at the time, I, actually, you know, I'm really lucky because my, my family, that, you know, they really supported me through that entire, that entire, sometimes they might not have fully agreed with me at the time. Now I can tell you with everything that has happened in the US and everything that the US has done around the globe, I don't have, there's no family member who isn't like, oh, I, I think I couldn't get out of America in time because now they're kind of trapped there because of 
COVID, the economy, and everything like that. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of lucky. They, they understood it. Maybe they thought it's kind of extreme, but then at the same time, they, they understood what, what I was thinking. And, you know, I would, I would say most, most of my family at that time even kind of agreed but it's just like those those old guys in the Marine Corps, they, they really couldn't do anything. You know, they were already locked in there with their life. But, you know, I had the opportunity to, to get out. So, you know, I think they understood. Right. So, yeah, it, was, it right. wasn't really like a controversy. Or anything. I'm really lucky in that way. I've had some friends who, who didn't understand it. When I was trying to get out of the military, the, 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 you know, the people that I knew in the, in the Marine Corps, my age, my, my rank, uh, they, didn't, they didn't agree. Or, or like it then, but now, years later, after they went through the, the system and got discarded by the system, now I think they, they kind of see and, and understand. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. And then, so now, um, you leave, and then that's, uh, you take it one step further later. You start speaking out. Um, so w before we talk about that, I want to ask, what was the thought process behind when you said, all right, I, I want to start talking about this, some of this stuff. What was the thought process behind using a pen name? Why did you feel you needed to do that? And, you know, what, what were you afraid of? What, what, what was the thought process behind that when you said, I want to speak up, but I got to do it behind a pen name? One, I, I, I'm the kind of person where I don't want to do any of this. If somebody else wants to step forward and, and get all the credit, they're more than happy to do it. But nobody was doing it. And so I thought, you know, the, the best way to do this is to just use a pen name, get the information out there, have other people take that information and run with it, which is what happened a lot of the times. And I, I was really, you know, at that time, the alternative media started to kind of expand, you know, especially after the Arab Spring. And so, you know, I was quite happy with that arrangement. And that's, that's one reason I used the pen name. Another reason is uh, I saw what they were doing in Iraq. I started studying. I started looking what the U.S. was really doing around the world. They, they murder people. They kill people. They throw them in prison. Uh, they torture people. Uh, th they have a lot of indirect ways of ruining your life. So if you could try to, you know, minimize the, their ability to do that to you, then it might be a smart thing to do. And then, you know, as I was doing this, I saw a lot of examples. There's a, there's a media, kind of like an alternative media guy here in Thailand. He's Thai and he, his, all of his work is in Thai and he was really vocal about the US backed proxies that they were trying to get into power and keep in power here in Thailand. And they machine gunned his van in broad daylight in the middle of the city. And he luckily, like by a miracle, didn't didn't die. He survived, and he's still doing media to this day. Uh, but I thought a guy like that, who's well known, has a lot of connections and, and influence. Even he's not immune to this. So who am I? I'm an I'm an ant. You know, they could just step right. on me. Nobody would even notice. So yeah, that's yeah, kind of have you. Yeah. Now, now that you're out in the open, have you had any media outlets coming after you yet, or any kind of a pushback as of yet? I mean, I have people attack me in the media. That's pretty pretty normal. And they, they had been doing that since I was under a pen name. Uh, you know, they have an Adrian Zenz pretty much assigned to every country. So the Adrian Zenz of Thailand is a guy named Andrew McGregor Marshall who used to work uh, for Reuters uh, for years and years. It's unimaginable that how this guy was able to survive there. Even knowing what Reuters does is not journalism, but still. And he, for six years, claimed that I was this guy, Michael Persh. He's like this elderly American expat that lives here in Thailand. Uh, he had no evidence. He convinced everybody that this was true. The, the BBC repeated it. People from the New York Times repeated it. You could see it in some articles, Tony Cartolucci's Michael Persh. Uh, and it's funny, too, because when I came out under my real name and, you know, he claimed he had IP addresses and sources, you know, with an S, not just a source, sources, multiple sources. And so it's he pretty much torpedoed his whole reputation, but he's immune because as long as he doesn't debate me or acknowledge this, no one else in the media is going to bring this up and he'll get away with it. And, and everyone who repeated his lie, they'll, they'll get away with it. Uh, since I came out, yeah. That guy? yeah. Oh yeah. I, I challenged him. Well, he, he was looking for a debate. Uh, he was looking for a debate with uh, someone that I know that I that I work with here, 
And he told, because he's Thai and he's, he's not really into politics, he said, why don't you debate Brian? That would be much better. You, get, you know, you guys are both been covering this for a long time. It'd be a better match. And he just disappeared, you know, like a, a, a cockroach. You turn the, <laughs> the light on in the kitchen and he just goes under the refrigerator. And so, yeah, that's what he did. Uh, he said he would respond in a few days. Now it's been uh, months. <laughs> it's been months and he hasn't. Hasn't right. responded. So yeah, this is the sort of, and I've had other people challenge me to a debate, and then when I say, okay, let's do it, they disappear. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I know what you mean. I've, I've, I've had the same sort of a thing, and uh, I've had BBC uh, come after me. They dropped me after I started pushing back. I said, listen, you know what? You want to ask me these questions? Just answer one question for me. And it was regarding a, a coverage of a, a bogus story from Xinjiang that four thousand people had signed a petition on asking them for answers, and they just refused to respond to it. And they wanted to interview me about Xinjiang. They were going to ask me really superficial questions, but I said, no problem. Just answer this question. Communication stopped and they dropped me from their story. Al Jazeera did put me in their story. I was also featured on Voice of America, America's uh, propaganda, a government propaganda outlet. Um, and it's really interesting because, yeah, when these people, they come after you, they're not looking for a meaningful conversation with anybody who challenges the mainstream media narrative. If you're supporting the mainstream media narrative and the consensus, they'll ask you meaningful questions about your work about, you know, okay, how did you come to this conclusion? What's, you know, what do you think is happening next? Just engaging meaningfully when they engage with people like us, it's, um, it's an interrogation. It's an attack. It's, uh, you know, the kinds of questions are, how do you feel being a mouthpiece for the Chinese government or the Chinese communist party? It's like, really, like, do you want to engage me in any of the actual real issues I've raised here? Um, so there's this system in place, definitely, that uh, carefully manages the narrative. Reuters hired, uh, I believe it was Reuters or AP. They, they had hired somebody, an ex-CIA officer, and, she, you know, when they, when they uh, announced her placement, they even admitted right in the article that it was to serve the desperate needs of the American government's, you know, messaging or something like that. Like, it's just, it's yeah. all uh, pretty I I incredible. So... What I want to what I want to know now uh, is uh, what 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 drives you? Why why speak up? Like, what is it you're afraid of happening? What is it you want to happen? Like, what is it that drives you? Because this is a this is a, a massive uh, burden to have. Uh, what what is it that makes it worth it for you to say no? I got I've got to do this. I mean, I was in the military. I know what those weapons can do. I mean, they, even if you're not in combat, you fire all of these weapons. I was a advanced weapon specialist. I, I know what they do to people. I know what they do to the human body when they're used. I know what they do to a city. Uh, I, you know, when you're, when you're upset about geopolitics and you're studying what, you know, what is the U S doing in Iraq? What did they do to Fallujah multiple times? Uh, what are they doing in Libya and Syria? And, um, you know, not to get too graphic, but I study everything. I don't, oh, I don't want to know about that part. I study everything. So when, when ISIS was butchering people, you don't want to watch that sort of stuff. But you need, you need to understand what's happening, what these people face. When you see that, when you see it happen to countries that you thought it would never happen to, then you're in, you're in a country that's also being targeted you look at the, these are, could be your neighbors. And the next thing, it could be your neighbors. It could be your neighborhood. It could be the city you walk through uh, and work with and happen to the people that you know. We got here in Thailand, we got a little taste of it in 2010. There were between 300 to 500 armed militants that took part in, the, in that violence. They had war weapons, M16s, AK-47s, grenade launchers, hand grenades, sniper rifles. Uh, almost 100 people died. It was weeks of violence. And they, they burned sections of the city. Places that I have gone in the past are, are now yeah. burned and, and they had, had to be had, rebuilt. Yeah. You had some Uyghur militants also that did some bombings in, um, in Thailand. Um, 2015, then, yes. Tw yeah, 2015. And then there were some Uyghurs who escaped from a prison in Thailand. They went over to Malaysia. And then the World Uyghur Congress or one of the NED connected groups in the, in the U.S. was arranging like their visas for them, trying to get them out. Uh, Western Union and and, and uh, those companies, they blocked the payments to them because they were terrorists. So they escaped from prison. But they were trying to get 
funds that were coming from the U.S. government to get these kinds of, uh, 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 well, there were suspected criminals because they were still in, in prison at that point, uh, awaiting trial or whatever it was, uh, to get them out. Uh, it really, it really is remarkable. But I think what it takes first is for people to look at these people on the other sides of the planet as humans. First of all, this is what infuriates me. When you look at that attack at the airport in Kabul, what happened? Everybody was talking about the Marines who died. And yes, it's sad. But there were even more Afghans that died and people were acting like they didn't even exist. They didn't even exist. There were pastors in the U.S. coming out talking about, oh, our thoughts and prayers are with these, was it 12, uh, 12 Marines? You know, nobody, they were like, the, 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 the Afghans didn't even exist. Um, and it's remarkable if somebody, if, if people really took a second to reflect on that and say, hold on a second, why are we not even seeing these people as humans? What's wrong with me? How have I been fed, you know, propaganda to the point that I'm just like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only empathizing with, with, with people who look like me or who are, you know, live in my country. Um, it's just this weird thing. Uh, I don't know. I can't, I can't really wrap my head around it because these things have like w w these bombings happen, you know, o Obama drone strikes weddings, you know, uh, uh, Clinton bombed the only uh, 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 TB vaccine place in Sudan. And like all of these things keep happening over and over again. And people just like, eh, you know, that's war. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what's going like. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Well, uh, they've never been on the receiving end of it. They're, they're always watching it at home on TV. They're, they're not in a country where that has happened where it had been a place that they were at, you know, that intersection where the bombing happened. I, we, I used to pass through there all the time. It could have very easily have been me who was one of the casualties, you know, just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sometimes you're just taking a taxi or something and it's going right past that, that shrine that got bombed uh, in 2015. And so when, when you see this, when you, and, and then when you see the people getting maimed, you know, blown into pieces and, and you know that area and you know what, who those people were. Uh, you might not know them personally, but you know who, who, what they were normally doing, you know, people just selling stuff on the side of the road, trying to, trying to make a living, uh, just traveling around with their family. And, and then to see that happen, it, it's very, very personal. It could, it could have been anyone that I knew here. Uh, and I have known people, uh, luckily no one that I know has died in any of the violence here in Thailand, but I know someone who got injured I know another person who had to leave Thailand for a year and then come back because they were being harassed by the opposition because they, you know, they asked a perfectly legitimate question and they didn't, they didn't like that and they didn't want to give the answer. And so they sent thugs to, to harass them and they had to leave for a year. So when it's happening to you personally or to people around you or in the country you live in, you're on the receiving end. You can start wrapping your mind around what it feels like. And, and, you know, Daniel, you're in, in China. I think you can, you can understand also what, what the implications are of, of a country that's doing this all around the world and how it's put a big target on China and, and would do it if it could. It would do it, definitely do it to China. It's doing it all along its periphery. Yeah, and in Xinjiang, they were doing it. I mean, you know what? The, the, when, as soon as they delisted ETIM as a terrorist organization, they basically gave them their blessings. They basically said, OK, and now all of a sudden after they did that, you had a whole network of apologists coming out saying, well, there's little evidence that they ever existed, even though in 2018 there are literally generals admitting that they were striking ETIM in Afghanistan. You know, even though there are 10,000 Uyghurs fighting in Syria, their children are being trained in ISIS camps. They're fighting alongside Al Qaeda. They're beheading people in the streets like and I often say that too. you, you know, to, to pull in to tie in that point about when it's not happening close to home. I can tell you 100%, if these Uyghur militants, these and it's a small group of people, yeah, with the, the thing that people need to understand is they were attacking other Uyghurs in, uh, uh, in uh, Xinjiang also who weren't following their strict kind of uh, version of Sharia law. Um, so this small group of people, uh, small in relation to the population, but large when you look at the tens of thousands in uh, Syria, had they been leaving China and going to the West and attacking the West and displacing families like they are with the Kurds in, in, in Syria um, and, and doing the, carrying out these terrorist attacks like they did in Thailand and, and like they do in Syria, all of a sudden, if everything they were saying about China was true, 
which it's not. But if all of the, 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 the anti-terrorism measures were true, it wouldn't matter anymore. All of a sudden, people would say they'd have a new angle to go with. They'd say, China is not doing enough to stop this terrorism that's affecting us and our families. They are an exporter of terrorism. Oh, it would be such an opportune story. And they would go for it. That would be the leading story had that yeah, happened. Don't give them, don't give them any ideas because you <laughs> never know. I mean, because th this is pretty much what they have been doing for the last 20 years is, uh, you know, these Think about it. The, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group was was the Al Qaeda franchise in Libya that the U.S. had had actually been propping up for decades, and they were one of the key militant groups that they funded and backed and provided air cover for during the, the 2011 overthrow of the Libyan government. And then they brought these fighters to the U.K. and they were carrying out terrorist attacks there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The Manchester bombing. It's like, oops. It looks like there's some consequences aligning with Salafist jihadists. Who would have guessed? You know, <laughs> and, so and when, they'll they'll yeah. they'll blame they'll blame that that uh, influx because you saw how they were trying to leverage the the migrant crisis. They were trying to leverage it to broaden the intervention in Syria because they were saying, look, look at this blowback. This is because all of these refugees pouring out of these countries. This is why we need to intervene in Syria, which would have just exasperated it even even well, more well, well it's you know you know what was interesting for me I, I don't know if you know in the recent syrian elections they blocked uh uh they blocked syrians from voting in germany um in a, a couple of other countries too they didn't allow them they blocked off their consulate encircled it so they couldn't go and vote in their own election and i'm like well that's weird because you know, these are people who they say escaped uh, Assad. I mean, you would think that these are going to be very useful people to vote against Assad. Well, it turns out uh, afterwards, when you look at the footage from non-Western media outlets, if you look at RT and stuff like that, you see Syrians protesting. Now, they had Syrians on both sides, but there were also a lot of Syrians protesting and holding Assad posters supporting him. And it's like, well, hold on a second. I thought they left Syria because they were escaping Assad. Oh, it turns out they were fleeing the moderate rebels that America was arming and supporting, <laughs> you, you know? I mean, uh, it, it's remarkable how uh, th these kinds of things can be hidden so well and people just don't care. I mean, it's like, you know, you know, you know as well as I do to really get to the bottom of this stuff. It's a full-time job. But this is what the journalists are supposed to be doing. This is what mainstream media journalists are supposed to be doing. And they're not. They get, they get paid to do this stuff. And they're completely covering it up. And that's when you realize this is all really, really deliberate, uh, that, that, that this truth isn't getting out to people. And, and then it comes full circle back to, you know, why, why, you know, why do you do this? Why do I do this? I do it because nobody else is doing it. Literally no one in English language covers what's happening in Southeast Asia along China's peripheries. Uh, in English properly, you ha of course, you have the BBC, Reuters, AP, AFP, all of them, all doing it, but they're lying about it. And they're, they're doing to Southeast Asia what they do everywhere else, uh, everywhere else yeah. they go. And so no one else is doing it. So what do you do? You know that it's happening. You know what the consequences are if it goes unaddressed and no one else is doing it. What do you do? You don't want to do it, uh, but you have no choice because no one else is doing it. If someone else came along and did what I did, I would be more than happy to go back. I, you know, I was doing industrial design for the longest time, uh, you know, since I've been uh, in Singapore and Thailand, and I would love to go back to doing that. Such a satisfying job. This is this is stressful. It's every yeah. everything you dig into is horrible. It's just a hor every horror story after horror story, the, what they've done all around the planet, and uh, I mean, it's taxing on on your family. You know, uh, again, I'm lucky. I, you know, here in Thailand, I have a very understanding family. They support me, but it's stressful. It takes up a lot of time that you'd rather spend with your family. You know, right. I could go, I could go downstairs with with the, the with the kids and do my 3D design for for industrial design with any kind of noise. I, you know, it's like just how your brain works. But when you're writing and doing videos, you need to just like be up, away from everything. And, and working on it f for hours and uh, yeah, and it's not, n nothing fun or appealing about it. I did. I never yeah. wanted to do this. I don't want to do this, but nobody else is doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the challenge is um, there's a lot of people who don't want to know about it too. It's like it, when you, when you really dig underneath the surface and you see how much stuff is going on, 
when we present this to people, it's kind of overwhelming. It's like, you know, for somebody who, you know, you know, believe, you know, somebody who has a picture of Captain America hanging on their wall at home or something like that. If you all of a sudden start to tell them the truth about what American Empire and their allies, uh, Australia and Canada and the UK does, it's just too much for them to handle. And it's like they just want to plug their hand, their fingers in their ears and say, la, 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 you know, that this is not this is not happening. And they want to preserve their um, uh, their reality. And, and it makes it challenging, too, because it, it, it becomes where it's difficult for people like us to cross over. And I was talking to uh, Rania. I was on an interview with her on her show where, you know, I'm fighting back against some of the anti-China propaganda. Uh, I know what's really going on. I know what's not being covered. But then when you start realizing other stuff is happening around the world, like, hold on a second, the narrative about Syria is wrong also. You almost want to stay in your lane and you don't want to go across because, you know, I'm already, you know, you're already called a, if you, if you fight back against the, the claims in Xinjiang, you're a genocide denier, even though the propaganda resembles exactly what they were using in the last propaganda war. And then you go over to Syria and then all of a sudden you're called an Assadist if you focus on that too. It's just like too much to handle. But I think it's really imperative for people like us to cross over and say, okay, hold on a second. This is, and, and looking for the patterns because it really is, it's kind of like the same playbooks used over and over again. Um, absolutely. And that's the thing. Uh, if you figure it out in one place, so I, I was watching it unfold here in Thailand in 20, 2009, 2010. And I, I'm familiar with all of the groups and I know where their funding comes from. You know, I, I fought with this one fake uh, media NED funded organization called Project Thai for like six months because they were trying to deny it. And their their followers their, their followers were like, no, I've been to their office. There's no way they're getting that amount of money. And, and of course, eventually they had to admit it, that they were getting you know, millions of Thai bot, which is, which is a lot of money here. Uh, so you, know, you figure it out in Thailand. And then the next year, 2011, was the Arab Spring. And as soon as those protests started, uh, I started following the money. And sure enough, all, all of those protest groups, the, the opposition leaders, they were all linked to the United States the UK, France. And when I started telling people this, no one wanted to believe it. Even people in the alternative media did not want to believe it because they had this much more compelling narrative that this was an anti-US, anti-Israel uprising against these, you know, Mubarak in Egypt who, you know, he played all sides and he, he seemed like he should have done more against the US or Israel. And so him getting overthrown that, you know, that appealed to people. But it doesn't matter what you think or what you want. It only matters what's really happening. And what was really happening was those protests were engineered years in advance by the U.S. All the documentation is there. All the evidence is there. Uh, they, they trained them. They sent them in to overthrow their respective countries. They wanted to create a region-wide geopolitical reorganization. And then, you know, we had U.S. Senator John McCain even openly say, this is a virus that's going to go to Moscow and Beijing next. And I knew that it was going to come to Asia. So at, from 2011 onward, I, I, I said, I have to do as much as possible to, to expose this entire process, not just in Thailand, but everywhere they do it because it's all connected. If you defeat it in one place, you make it more difficult for them to do it everywhere. If they are successful in one place, it will embolden them everywhere else they want to try to do this. So uh, everyone's right. fate is tied together. Right. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, I do notice, I feel like, and I don't know, I've got to be careful about maybe it's just because of the circle that I'm involved in. I feel like more people are waking up, though. Um, you know, you would think that only, you know, after a certain period of time of recycling the same playbook over and over again, it gets a bit more difficult. And I mean, the U.S. has a history of, uh, you know, changing things up a bit. You know, they, uh, they, they close the School of Americas and then they still continue the program, but under a different name, you know. Um, yeah. the, the, the CIA no longer does these kinds of covert operations. They rely on the NED to do it and they shift things up a little bit. Um, but more and more people seem to be waking up to it. I think the next, and I don't know if you've seen this trend also, the next trend is going where everybody else is going to alternative media, alternative media on YouTube and stuff like that. You know, you have this phenomena called bread tube um, where you get these people who are, you know, so-called leftist um, 
uh, on the surface anti-imperialist um, and they're willing to throw you a bone once in a while and criticize, say, oh, yeah, America's completely wrong with sanctioning Cuba. But when it comes to the most important narratives to preserve American empire, they're completely on board. They actually underneath it all. They're really kind of sneaky. And they they I feel like it's a kind of like a Bellingcat kind of a thing, too. It's like a state sanctioned version of WikiLeaks where they'll throw you a bone once in a while. But the really important narratives, whether it be the Syrian chemical attack or these kinds of things, they're they're on board making sure. No, no, this narrative is too important right now. We can't let this one go. I feel like that's going to be the next stage of um, introducing a little bit more of nuanced propaganda. I don't know how you feel about that theory and or if you've seen kind of similar things. Uh, you're absolutely right. 100%. That is exactly what they're doing. Uh, Bellingcat was a perfect example. As a matter of fact, a lot of these NED funded fake media platforms like Prachatai here in Thailand, that's how they that's how they market themselves as some sort of independent alternative media, when in fact, they're funded by the US government, and they are com completely involved in, in promoting and advancing US foreign policy. There's another one, Coda Story, which is literally funded by the National <laughs> Endowment for Democracy. And they've tried they, to they deny that. It. They lied yes. about it. Yeah. And it's even on the NED's own website that they're funded by, by, by the NED. And uh, so why are you lying about it? Because you know you're doing something wrong. And, and so right. you're absolutely right. They're trying to, they're trying to couch their, their traditional propaganda uh, behind alternative media. And you, actually, you had a video that I well, actually a couple of videos about this topic, about these um, anti-China YouTubers who are now, you know, clearly being promoted one way or another by by the U.S. Paul, Paul Wolfowitz. Paul Wolfowitz is promoting one of these guys like. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and this is extremely dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, above and beyond hiding their source of funding, the key will be positioning themselves as an anti-U.S. outlet or saying, you know, just saying, I don't support the American government or even going as far as criticizing the American government um, over and over again. I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a video from, I can't remember if it was the 70s or something like that. There's this ex-CIA agent who's talking about uh, how things work in the agency. And he said, you know, uh, the agency acts as a source for these news outlets, for these journalists, and they'll give them four real stories, but every fifth story is disinformation. And it's disinformation that's important enough to really preserve the most important narratives uh, to achieve America's geopolitical goals. So I think that's what people need to look out for too, is people who on the surface, they're gonna be criticizing the US and they're gonna be saying, oh yeah, the US is terrible. But actually the framework, when you really pay attention to what they're doing, the o the overwhelming framework of what they're doing is to actually preserve American empire and to excuse what they're doing. Absolutely. It's exactly like US politics between le left and right, they pretend to hate each other, but in actuality, they're propping up one single agenda. And, you know, a lot of people say, why don't you write articles about Obama when he was in office or Trump when he's in office? Because it doesn't matter who's in office. It's, it's no the difference. exact same agenda. And I, I like to show people there's the uh, Office of the Historian. It's an official U.S. State Department website. They have documents from the 1960s where they talk about we're going to encircle and contain China. We're going to do it along uh, East Asia front, Korea and Japan, Southeast Asia and India and Pakistan. They've been doing that from then. It was already a longstanding policy then all the way up until now. They're doing the exact same thing along the same three fronts in the exact same way. Some of the organizations and individuals are literally the exact same people who, who were involved in it uh, for all these decades. So. Uh, people got to be real careful about that. Yeah, I, I think understanding the, the superficiality between the, the differences between the two parties, uh, the two party state in the U.S. is really important also. And I actually like to go as far as saying, and a, a lot of people don't like hearing this, that Trump was actually the most anti-war candidate out of a lot of them for a long time. I think he went in really wanting to be anti-war. I think he really wanted uh, uh, to uh, not be so active overseas. I, I think he really wanted to, uh, you know, have some sort of reconciliation with North Korea after he after he walked across the, the demarcation line. Um, the NED outlets went into hyperdrive trying to undo uh, what uh, Trump was doing there. 
but at the end of the day, he didn't succeed, right? I mean, a lot of a lot of bombs were still dropped. I mean, he killed, he, he assassinated Soleimani. Um, you know, uh, he was very transparent with what he wanted to do in, in Syria. He wanted the oil. You know, he said it. He he said the quiet bits out loud. Because I think once you get in there, there's certain parts that uh, of the institution that you just cannot change as the president. You don't have the power to do it. Uh, I, even you know Obama. I think I think Obama genuinely wanted to close Guantanamo Bay, and he really thought he was going to do it before he ran for president. And once he got in, he he gets to see the mechanisms uh, at play. He gets he, you know what 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 Putin says is some people in suits come down and sit down and say to him, "No, listen, this is how things work here," <laughs> you know, uh, because no matter what, it's just war, 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 war. The the foreign policy more or less is exactly the same which seems to be run by the military industrial complex. Before you continue, are you hearing a buzzing coming through? I'm hoping that's only on my end. Um, I don't, I don't hear. Okay, good. good. It's just in my headphones. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. What are your thoughts on that? On the, 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 the superficial differences between, um, between these groups. You have to just look at uh, where, where does real power flow from it? It flows from, from money, who controls money, who has factories, who controls industry, who's the one ma making the weapons, the ships and the planes and who's flying them and servicing them. And it's not, it's not the White House. They have, they're basically a ceremonial position. It's Wall Street and Washington and, and Washington is controlled by lobbyists. We, you know, we're, we're familiar with the corporate funded think tanks. And they openly, they openly write about things that, that are going to definitely become policy uh, years in advance, you know, like I, I, I have repetitively covered which path to Persia. This is a Brookings Institution document. It's, it's very dry and boring. Nobody's going to read it, but it's public. You can just download it and read it. And they tell you the whole plan of, of encircling and containing Iran, uh, getting rid of Syria, all everything, funding and arming terrorist organizations. Everything is there. It's public knowledge. They create these policies. These think tanks are funded by corporations. Then they have lobbyists bring it to Washington to get rubber stamped. And they have this relationship with the corporate media where they sell this to the public to make the public think that this is what they want. And this is how American foreign and domestic policy, this is how it actually really works. So you can vote all you want to put someone in the White House or to put someone in Congress at the end of the day, they have no control over the people who are actually driving, crafting, driving and implementing foreign policy or, or domestic policy, for that matter. It, it's a really scary system. Um, I mean, when you look at the the influence that, um, well, the real powers at play and then the influences that come in afterwards, also the military industrial complex funding candidates like this is a scary situation to have. Um, you know, you obviously you have military industrial complex uh, funded think tanks in Australia also like uh, Aspie guiding their policy making. Um, it's a really, really scary world. And what's what, what world and what's perplexing to me is that people who even recognize the massive issues with their system still join along in this idea that Western liberal democracies um, need to be spread elsewhere. You know, they're like, yeah, we should spread democracy elsewhere. I mean, that's saying that you're satisfied enough with your system that you're ready to export it elsewhere. And that's, that's a scary situation to have also, because a lot of people, they always say like, well, yeah, we have problems. That's what aboutism. Don't talk about that. It's like, no, no, we have to talk about that. If you want to spread your system elsewhere and you are supposedly supposed to have a government that is for the people, by the people, that is directed by you, it's a democracy, you really have the power. You have a lot to answer for, first of all because this is on you then but you know if you're you're really ready if you're really ready to spread this, spread this no we, we don't call this what about is let's say okay let's look at this system you think works elsewhere and actually you know i'm i'm hearing a 21 day quarantine I, i'm 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 preparing to read uh two books i'm i'm almost through this one this is uh, democracy for realists um and uh talking about the limitations of how it works. And then I'm looking at the China model because it's a confusing. I don't even know what the answer is to like, I would never ever say that China's system should be used in the West. But I also think people in the West should never ever say their system should be used in China. But there definitely is something really wrong 
with the Western systems. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to fix it. And that's why I'm, I'm reading some of the stuff. I'm like, there's gotta be a way to, um, to do something, to change things in a way that will kind of repair some of these issues. Whatever we've tried so far hasn't worked. You know, you have protests, maybe the government listens to you. Most of the time they don't. And then they just go back doing to doing the same thing. But, um, what I want to do from here is I, I actually want to uh, – actually, no, before I move into that, the final bonus clip at the end that I wanted to review with you, um, maybe you can explain um, a little bit more about what kinds of stories you cover, what regions it covers, if it's completely global. Give a little bit of an insight so that people um, know what to expect when I direct them over to your channel and your and your blog and all that kind of stuff. I, I focus – I focus on Asia, Southeast Asia, mostly because it's something that's that no one else is really covering, not, not in English language. Uh, but I, I do, I had been for since it started the Arab Spring because so many people were getting that wrong and I didn't want to. Every time you have to start covering a country, you have to do a, a huge amount of research to understand it to, in order to, to present a compelling argument about what's going on there. And so it's a, you know, it's a mountain that you have to climb. So every time something happens in a country and nobody is, I, I have to ask myself, is this a mountain you have, you want to climb? And you have to, uh, before people started focusing on Venezuela, I used to, to kind of show people what was going on there too. Cause a lot of people were missing that. And so I, I have written about things all over the world, but I try to focus mainly on Eurasia and Southeast Asia in particular is like a very, uh, focused area for me because uh, this is where I am and this is what I know best. But I, I have written almost as many articles about the conflict in Syria as I have about Thailand, which I, I was kind of surprised when I was checking, you know, after a couple of years, I was looking back, I was like, that's a lot of articles about Syria. But, but it's important because if you understand what they're doing to Syria, you can understand what they're trying to do to Thailand or anywhere else for that matter. Um, and then I do, I cover this, this concept of democracy promotion, which is not really dem democracy in the West is a system of control. People have no control over their system. Corporations control it. So they give you these elections and they make you think that this is the, the relief valve. Everyone is upset. They know the system doesn't uh, serve them. So they go and they keep voting and fighting with each oh, other yeah. over left and right. And this is a system of control. It is not democracy. And this is what they're trying. They're not promoting democracy overseas because that doesn't even make sense. They're extending this system of control over the rest of the world because democracy promotion, just even at face value, you have to think about it. Democracy is a process of self-determination. So how can a foreign country promote it inside of your country it makes absolutely no sense at all. What that is, is actually foreign interference. It's against the UN charter, international law, and just basic common sense. If you want real democracy, it has to be something that springs from the, the people in that country, not something imposed on them from, especially from Washington or London uh, yeah. or yeah. exactly. I think I think one th really thing to keep in mind that's important also is that America's happy with promoting democracy overseas. If you're right, if um, it it, it uh, takes form in um, a situation where corporate interests really actually control what's going on, you know, you're allowed to have a democracy um, as long as you uh, a have a system that's open enough to be infiltrated, um, and b as long as you vote the right way. If the Palestinians vote for Hamas, no, sorry, that was the wrong decision. You know, where there's going to be consequences for that. If, you know, in Venezuela, you vote for the wrong person or wherever it is, no, sorry, there are consequences for that. So they're not really spreading democracy overseas. If they can implement the kind of democracy that gives them the control they want, sure, great. If they can't, the second option is to install a dictator. They will absolutely have no problem with installing a dictator who will be friendly to American geopolitical and corporate interests. I think that's the thing uh, that people need to understand also, is that no, there isn't a real desire to promote democracy around the world. The real desire is to have the final goal of having people controlled just as much as they are back home. And if they can be controlled while having this superficial feeling of uh, satisfaction that they have a little bit of power, they're angry at uh, uh, Donald Trump, so now they're going to vote for Biden. He's not really going to make any sort of a difference in your life, but hey, 
you know, at least I've got this superficial feeling of, of, of control, but that's not really, yeah, there, there is no real concept of true democracy that they're spreading, uh, uh, spreading overseas. Now, um, that's a really good tie in to the bonus clip that I want to end on. And it also ties into, uh, the anti-China YouTubers who, you know, I speak about. So, one guy in particular, um, he's, he's Matthew Tyden, a Lao 86. He's been propped up by um, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, the one of the architects behind the Iraq war. And he's been on Voice of America, not on Voice of America like me, where they were attacking me, promoting him, uplifting him. And in both cases, Paul Wolfowitz and Voice of America, they shared a link to, and they said, this is where you can find him. They really want people to listen to this guy. Ever since that happened, he went over the top kind of um he's not he's not he's not one of these uh youtubers i was talking about who has nuance and who you know adds in a few insults here and there against the american government he's like gone completely like gung-ho on this and i remember there was somebody saying it was like last year or something like that he said he really wants to start learning more about geopolitics and that was interesting to me because i was like all right this guy who's like so pro-America and so anti-China, he's going to go out and he's going to learn about history and geopolitics. And I'm like, he's in, he's in for a really rude awakening. But what he did was he just, he's like, I, I don't even know how to explain this. I just got to show you the clip. I'm going to show you the clip of what he put out. I think it was yesterday or the day before explaining why America deserves to be the world power, why that's a good thing, how they, how they, they were involved in bringing peace and prosperity to the world. There's a, there's a lot of stuff to unpack here and it's gonna blow your mind. Let's take a look. I know this is a bitter pill to swallow and it's very unfair to the people of China, but in order to rule the world, you have to be an influence, not just a bully. Take the USA for example. There's a reason that the USA has so much influence in the world. You see, post-World War II, most of the developed world was absolutely destroyed in ruins and getting past this whole empire phase. Think of the UK. At this time, the USA offered the world a deal. They said, as long as it's not the Soviet Union, you can trade with whoever you want. You won't even need to use your own navy to protect your goods because we will do it for you. This new order around the world will be ours, America's, and it's up to you if you want to be part of that or not. Most places in the world took advantage and agreed to the deal. And for the first time in history, countries without massive natural resources or military power could actually grow their economies and the world by and large, flourished. The USA let the world do what they want to do, and if anyone threatened that trade, they would step in and stop whatever nonsense was happening. Yes, America spread its pop culture and ideals of freedom and democracy to many places abroad, but the biggest American influence was just participating in this system of trade, where the USA will back you up if you play nicely. <laughs> I, I mean, it's indistinguishable from the British Empire, which he said the world was just getting over. I mean, like, what is he? Uh, but you can see he's channeling this because this is what these think tankers all do. This is their their notion is that there needs to be an international order, rules based order run by the U.S. Uh, U.S. only is four percent of the population. But, you know, we're, we're all for democracy, except in that aspect, I guess, four uh, percent of the world running the rest of the planet. Uh, and, and that's what he's doing. He's channeling these things because he's, you know, he wants his own think tank. He wants his own Bellingcat. It's pr pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there's 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 so much stuff to, to uh, unpack there in, in such a short period of time. That's not a that's not like different clips put together. That's one stretch of of him speaking. And let me um, or have a little a, a transcript here. Um, so. So. OK. So I know so he starts off right. I know this is a bitter pill to swallow, and it's uh, is very uh, unfair to the people of China. But in order to rule the world, you have to be an influence and not just a bully, as if um, 
that's not what America does, as if America's not a bully. <laughs> as soon as he said, take the USA, for example, it should have been game over there. I mean, that's the point where people are like, OK, next video, please. <laughs> you know, you, after yeah. that sentence. So, um, so there's a reason the U.S. has so much influence around the world in the world. You see, post World War II, most of the developed world was absolutely destroyed in ruins. Well, I mean, the U.S. wasn't. I mean, the U.S. wasn't affected um, uh, like Europe was. And what, what's interesting is that previously in previous wars, there were plans, there were systems in place to cancel debt after a war happened uh, to allow nations to build themselves up. And the U.S. refused to do that. I think it was in relation to Germany in specific uh, to basically hold people kind of under their thumb. Um, stop me at any point, too, if you want to add anything in, too, if anything comes up uh, uh, that you want to talk about. But um and and getting past this whole uh, empire phase, think of the UK. That's that's the point you picked up on. Like that's where I, I just thought the US has hundreds of military bases. They're involved in multiple wars of aggression right now. You know, as he was saying that the US is involved in multiple wars of aggression, both directly and indirectly. Uh, the US and its allies are guilty of the worst crimes against humanity of the 21st century. N nothing that they have even made up about China even comes up to a fraction of what the US and its allies have done in front of the entire world. The invasion of Iraq alone, uh, based on a deliberate malicious lie, a million dead Iraqis, millions of lives destroyed, and that includes thousands of Western troops, you know, American troops. There's, there's still troops back in the US losing their mind and, and going on killing sprees because they were used and then discarded by the system and just left as ticking time bombs uh, inside of America. So, I mean, where does he get, where does he get that? Where is China even being accused of doing that, let alone actually yeah. doing that? I mean, you, you were involved in, in weapons also. So, I mean, you probably know very well in Fallujah what the children look like now after the spent uranium munitions and the white phosphorus was used there. Like the birth defects that are coming out of there are just, uh, I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're indescribable. Um, they're terrible. And uh, yeah, this is just out of this. This is out of this world. So he says, um, at this time, the USA offered the world a deal. I, I don't know. Where, where, where was that deal? I think they came in and said, this is the way it's going to be. There was no sort of a, this was, there was no negotiation. Yeah, when, um, when was they, the meeting they had at the UN where they agreed on all yeah. of this? I don't, I don't remember yeah. that. It's not been in my no. history book. Yeah, no, mine neither. They, uh, they said, as long as it's not the Soviet Union, you can trade with whoever you want. I mean, so, so first of all, let's say, as long as you don't trade with who we don't want you to trade with, you're going to be fine. But that's a fabrication also. They stopped multiple they, ever since then, they've stopped multiple countries from trading with each other. I mean, they, they even a, 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 an oil tanker from Iran to Venezuela. The U.S. government seized like pirates of the high seas and sold it. They sold it and they took the money themselves. Like, you know, there was a there was a company in, in, in Mexico who wanted to send fresh water to Venezuela during their drinking water crisis. And they were sanctioned. It's like, no, 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 th 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 this has nothing to do with the Soviet Union anymore, and it's still going on. Yeah, because, by the way, the Soviet Union has not existed for decades now, and so the U.S. is still doing exactly this. So what is their excuse for doing it now? And that's, and that's just if we focus on countries the U.S. smears and says are, are threats to global security. What about Germany when they were doing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline with Russia? The U.S. was was putting sanctions on Germany, one of their own so-called allies. And uh, apparently, Matthew is oblivious to the concept of mafia and how the U.S. operates as a geopolitical mafia, J just global spanning version of the mafia that you'd find in a local neighborhood, uh, pushing over stores, extorting protection money uh, and telling people you're not going to do business with so and so because we said so. This is mafia. This isn't. This isn't leadership. You, you know what? The, the last paragraph, I almost feel like, I don't know if he realizes he's doing it or not, but it is, a, it is a mafia statement. It is His last paragraph was, but the biggest American influence was just participating in the system of trade, where the USA will back you up if you play nicely. Like that's, that's, a, a, that's, that's now Matthew's own words, speaking like he's like, yeah, we're the mob bosses in town and this is how it's going to be, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if he, if he really knows what's going on, uh, but either way, I mean, he's really uh, fooling his audience. 
a, a lot of his audience, I think, maybe are just looking for some copium to kind of uh, uh, still uh, go to sleep um, and sleep well when there's a, a, a poster of Captain America on their wall. But um, so he goes on and says, um, you won't even need your own Navy to protect your goods. We will do it for you. <laughs> and, I mean, no, that 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 that. That doesn't happen. That's, not how, the, your, that's not how the world yeah. works. No, nope, sorry. That's, that, no, yeah. Um, this new world order will be ours, America's. I, I like how he says that nonchalantly also. Nonchalantly is just like, yeah, it's going to be ours. The world order is ours. It's like, yeah, that's the way it should be. Um, and it's up to you if you want to be a part of that or not. Well, we've seen the consequences if you say, no, we don't want to be a part of that. We don't want to be a part of the, uh, the, the, the global capitalist economy. We don't want our resources uh, exploited. We want to protect ourselves while we're growing up. You know, when, the, when, these, when these countries open up their borders too early to these uh, um, uh, corporate interests, I mean, it absolutely destroys them. And it's why you have all of these countries in Africa who have never been able to get ahead as well. Um, this didn't create some sort of a utopia where everybody flourished together. Um, not Just even have, close, uh, not even not even remotely. I don't even know. I, I mean, there was all of South America. There's all of there's all of Africa, the, the US for for uh, decades ravaged Southeast Asia, millions dead. Uh, the Middle East. Wh wh when has there been a year of peace in the Middle East since the end of World War Two? Never. So what is right. he talking about? There was well, rich white countries flourished. This is and and um. I, I don't know if I'm stepping over the bound, but him and the other guy, Winston, whatever his last name is. Yeah, yeah, Sturzel, uh, yeah. Serpenza, because, you know, his name is Winston, so he has to pick a tough guy, uh, internet ID. They're, they're <laughs> closet raised. I, I mean, I, when my family w uh, was from New York, but for some reason, when I was in grade school, we moved to central Pennsylvania, and they were not the most enlightened people. So I could, could say that they were a bit racist. And so I know what a racist sounds like and looks like. And that's what they are. And you know, when they're at a table and they're not sure if everyone at the table is a racist like them, they have a way of couching the racism. This is exactly what both of them do. They hate Chinese people because they're Chinese. They hate China because China is surpassing the West and they, are, they have the idea burned in their mind that there is a master race and that they are the master race. And it's, I just always thought it's so ironic that the people who think like this are the most compelling argument against the concept of a master race. So like Winston and Matt are very compelling <laughs> arguments that there is no such yeah. thing as a master race. You would, yeah, you would not want them in charge of things, that's for sure. Um, no, you're uh -huh. absolutely right. I mean, the, 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 the su supremacist language is coming through, it's oozing out of this, this oh, yeah. short clip uh, that absolutely. I, that I, that I sent you. So uh, that I played. Um, so he says most places in the world took advantage and agreed to the deal. Um, and for the first time in history, countries without a, without massive natural resources or military power could actually grow their economies and the world in large flourished. No, no, no. E even which, if you had one? natural which, resources. Which, yeah. One example. I don't, I don't know. What's he talking I mean, about? He even the global South countries with natural resources couldn't flourish properly. You know, they were they were forced to to uh, uh, they call it IMF fundamentalism to open up their economy in such a way that it led to famines in certain you know areas because they weren't allowed to put subsidies on on um, uh, agricultural products and stuff like that. Like, well, he's I he's mean, probably thinking of like Japan, for example. Like, if you ask, <laughs> "Hey, Matt, give me an example," he'd say Japan. But the whole reason there was uh, the U.S. fought Japan in World War II was because before Japan agreed to the deal and, and submitted to this wonderful uh, global order, uh, they were already developing their country. Yes, they lacked resources. They were getting those resources. They didn't lack every resource. They had human resources. They had an a, a industrious, well-educated population that was willing to, to work hard to compensate for that lack of natural resources. So to say that they had no resources is kind of a, is a misconception. They were doing it before World War II and then, oh, surprise, they kept doing it after World War II. Uh, and actually, for along with the US, you know, didn't occupy the country with tens of thousands of troops, uh, impose all kinds of economic controls and, and impositions on them as part of the their surrender at the end of World War II. So 
I, I just don't see that that argument here in Thailand. Thailand has a very complicated relationship with the U.S. because yeah. they, were, they were watching the U.S. bomb the rest of Southeast Asia, and they didn't want that to happen. And this is what they did during World War II. They just kind of made concessions with the Japanese. They made concessions with the Americans. They went along with it. They weren't enthusiastic about it. And then as soon as the war was over, the U.S. was out. Japan was out. The U.S. was out. And uh, they didn't agree to join some order. They weren't given a choice in the matter. They, they had no choice. They wanted balanced relations. They want balanced relations right now. They cannot have them because the U.S. will not tolerate it. This is a, a mafia entity on a global scale. Yeah, and, I, I mean, and one thing to keep in mind also is if Japan does too well in a certain area that's when the u.s comes in and says you know you're our ally and everything like that everything like this but your economy is growing a little bit too fast and they destroyed their electronics or their chip making uh market when they when they deliberately try to diversify it over to south korea when they try to kind of uh, uh, break uh, break them down a few notches because they were pretty high on the on the scale on the gdp scale globally uh, you know america doesn't have true allies they have temporary friends that includes Germany, like you were saying, with the pipeline, you know, they're, they're spying on Angela Merkel, you know, tapping her phone calls and everybody just kind of goes along with it. Even the European Union, they're just like, you know, there was this uh, a Belgian um, a politician. I like it where, where he says, you know, we're talking about uh, China spying on us. We've got no evidence. And meanwhile, America, we know they're spying on our politicians. And what do we do? We're saying. Oh, we're sorry. We'll try to speak slower next time so you can understand everything we're saying. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like... <laughs> it's, it's, it's exact, exactly, exactly the point. Uh, and, and you were talking about what would be the best system. And the best system is no specific system. The best system is multipolarism. Because the way human nature really works is that if uh, you give any single person control over everyone else, it's just human nature that they're going to abuse it. When there is a balance of power uh, amongst individual people in a community, in a state or province, within a country or around the globe, uh, you know, this is why the U.S. and Russia never went to war directly with one another, because there was a there was more or less a balance of power. And this is what Russia and China talk about all the time. And actually, you can see it. What is China doing? Unlike what the U.S. did, because you were just talking about how the U.S. Would, would knock a country down, even if it was their ally, if they were getting too strong. China's going into countries and building infrastructure, uh, s significant infrastructure. This is not what you do if you're an empire or a bully. You're giving them the power to further balance the globe against abuse, not just American right. abuse, but even China's own abuse You know, in, in, the, in the future, if ever they, you know, they're so powerful and they decide to go in that direction. They are laying the, the groundwork now to discourage that sort of future, the sort of future that leads you down uh, the path and then over the cliff that every empire goes over, which is the cliff the U.S. is going over right now. And uh, people like Matt and, and others like him, this is what they have to, just like you said, this is what they have to say to sing themselves back to sleep. They don't want to admit that the, it's over for them. Uh, they're, not going, they're not going to contain China, this international order of theirs. Uh, there's no justifying it, and its, it's days are, are done, and it's just going on pure momentum now. Uh, if you look at all of these countries, even countries that you think are stalwart U.S. allies, you can see the shift over the last 10 years, 20 years. Like I said, here in Thailand, there's still a lot of people with Cold, cold War mentality that think, oh, Thailand is still a stooge of the, the U.S. They're replacing all their military hardware with Chinese uh, tanks, ships, uh, rockets, everything. Uh, they're doing a high-speed rail from Kuoming to Bangkok through Laos. Uh, they, you know, they're the largest trade, you know, Thailand's largest trade partner is China. Largest investor is China. Largest source of tourism is China. More tourists from China than all, all Western countries combined. So, the, the world is changing. These people need to change with it. I, I always like to say the U.S. needs to find a place, a constructive place among other nations to work uh, rather than trying to impose itself on all other nations. Now, usually what happens when a country is getting too uh, cozy with China, uh, you especially see that in Africa, is that a, a considerable amount of American funded anti-China propaganda goes into that society. Are you already seeing that in Thailand? And is it working at all? 
Uh, it's, it's hard to tell of how, how effective it is, but these protests out in the streets, um, you know, uh, myself and Angelo Giuliano, uh, we do these live streams of the protests and we, we spotted a shirt that said anti sinovac like they actually made shirts that said anti sinovac on the back. Uh, they carried the flags of the Taiwan independence movement and the Vatican and, and the Taiwan, the actual Taiwan flag. They had the East Turkestan flag waving in the intersection where that bombing took place in 2015. Uh, and I pointed that out in a video. And you know, this is the thing, this is how I know they know what they're doing because after I, I exposed that and it went viral in, in the Thai media, they stopped flying the East Turkestan uh, separatist flag. So now yeah. they only fly uh, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Myanmar, uh, but not the East Turkestan flag, but they used to. And now they don't because they, they know how bad that look, that one looks, that, but they're totally on board. With the exactly back to what you were talking about. It hasn't affected other people. So when people are flying these flags in Australia and they fly it a lot in Australia, standing together with Australian politicians like Rex Patrick, everybody's like, oh, that's a nice flag. So it's pretty blue, you know? They don't have, you know, if, if they did what they did in Thailand or <laughs> worse in Syria, people would be like, that flag does not represent something that we want in our country. And we empathize with China as to why that flag does not belong in China either. Like this, the, 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 this is what these, this is the flag that these terrorists um, fly. I think this multipolar uh, world with multiple powers or people, you know, without one single global superpower is definitely the solution. I mean, even you look at Syria. I mean, Syria would have been, these jihadists would have already set up a caliphate if it wasn't for Russia already. You know, if it wasn't exactly. Russia uh, uh, fighting back against ISIS and doing all of this kind of stuff. Um, you know, w without that, I mean, we would be in a much worse situation in um, in Syria, that's for sure. But um, continuing on, so where did I get to? So, uh Okay, the world at large flourished. The USA let the world do what they want, what they wanted to do. Um, and if anyone threatened that trade, they would step in and stop whatever nonsense was happening. I like how it's a really indescript nonsense. Like, you know, that nonsense means if you were actually thinking of doing things your own way, if you were actually looking at imp implementing socialist programs, if you were actually looking at limiting capital flight or limiting the amount of foreign enterprises that could come in and exploit your people. That's what he's referring to as nonsense when he says, as long as you don't do any of that nonsense and you do exactly what we say, how we say, and the way we want you to do it, everything's going to be fine here. This is like really like gangster language we're talking about here. You know, <laughs> it is. It's, well, I mean, if you remember in grade school, this is how the bully would talk. You know, you got to do, you got to yeah. do things his way. Or he's gonna beat you up or push you yeah. down the stairs. I mean, this is yeah. what he's saying. He's acting like this is this is great. I don't understand why. Yeah. It's, it's obvious the world isn't interested. Yeah. Why America's doesn't everybody else are. love it? Why doesn't everybody else love it? Uh, it's great, and I'm the one on top. Woohoo! I've got an American exactly. passport. Why wouldn't every exactly. any everybody else want to live under our global world order? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's man. So then he goes, yes, America spread its pop culture, ideals of freedom and democracy to many places abroad. No, you didn't. You know, <laughs> it's like that's not we, we already discussed that earlier, though. That's not that's not the M.O. Um, that's not what they're trying to do. And then he finishes with that, like I said, the gangster uh, statement. But the America's biggest influence was just participating in the system of trade where the USA will back you up if you play nicely like that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as opposed to how the U.S. itself plays. And, and again, right. when you hear uh, U.S. politicians talking about the international rules-based order, what which order, are, what are they talking about? Because is, is it an order where the U.S. can maliciously make up claims about a country and then launch a war of aggression without any approval in the U.N., completely decimate a country and then squat on it for 20 years? Uh, what How does that fit into this illusion that people like Matt are, are peddling here? Which he's actually just parroting from the, these corporate think tanks and the corporate media, because this is this is how they try to sell America and why it should have this unwarranted influence around the globe that it definitely should not have at, at best right. a balance of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what you were saying about you know with no approval and stuff like that it was the same thing, you know, with when when uh, they decided to assassinate Soleimani, 
uh, there were there were there were actual senators in the U.S. who stood stood up and said, how could this happen without consulting any of us, without any of this happening? How can you just go ahead and do this? And then, of course, the part of the story that was covered up. Well, first of all, it's whitewashing. It's whitewashing how much uh, Suleimani did uh, to fight against ISIS. Um, that is completely taken out. But one thing that was interesting was that no media was reporting on the fact that he was on his way to a peace mission uh, to discuss uh, to, well, on peace talks with Saudi Arabia. Um, the Iraqis confirmed this as well. Um, that was removed. You weren't allowed to talk about it. And then Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they started removing people who, who were adding that context in. And they came out with statements saying anybody who is, you know, showing, uh, I can't remember the word they used, empathy towards the Iranian regime will be removed from our platform. Something along the lines of that. It was like really uh, bizarre. The, this you, is the you, freedom you, and democracy Matthew is talking about yeah, where yeah. as long as you oh, yeah. talk as long as you speak nicely, you can have free speech or we'll just delete you. And that, that's the thing, actually, that ties in. So after that happened, because the strike happened on Iraqi soil, the Iraqi parliament, I can't remember how many, it was like 247 or something like that. Every single one voted to expel the U.S. from Iraq. And, and so this is, you know, America gave Iraq self-determination. They, they, they set up their democracy and their democracy spoke. Their representative yeah. spoke and said, we want America out. And then the State Department came out with a, 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 a memo saying, yeah, no, nah, we're not going. It doesn't really work like that. You know, yeah, we, we gave you democracy. But at, at the end of the day, you still have to listen to what we say. You know, <laughs> know your it, place, it, please. Exactly. So it's it's democracy. But the, I, the Iraqi people and the, and the government in Iraq do not have the final say, obviously. Mm. And then what is it revealed as? It's, in, it's revealed as the same old imperialism that the West has been doing for centuries, where they just come into a country and they are guiding its destiny and, and for their own purposes. And, you know, there used to be people just like Matt back selling British imperialism, uh, which was just genocide and exploitation. But they're saying we have to spread culture and civilization. Look at these barbarians. Look how backwards they are. We need to go and straighten them out. And this is what Matt's talking about. And again, uh, he, is a he is a closet racist. People like Winston are closet racist. And it's the imperialism is rooted in racism and in, in the idea that you're better than these other people and they should be subjugated to you and what you want done yeah. in their country on their land with their resources. Yeah, I mean, that language comes through it completely. And there's an irony also, because these are the same kinds of people who anybody who says, hold on a second, we don't actually have any evidence for this Xinjiang genocide narrative. The story doesn't add up. If you look at this, you look at the data, you look at the stuff that they're using to promote this story. It actually it, it doesn't make sense. He, they call those people genocide deniers. But what you spoke about actually it brings in may, makes me think of the the ultimate irony is that they are just like these apologists that existed for british empire they are not only they're they're beyond they're something worse than genocide deniers they're genocide promoters because they're they're promoting this saying yes this is the way the world should work we should be able to go around and bomb the shit out of anybody who doesn't uh what was the word he used uh uh if you if who don't play nicely you know, uh, and of course, they're the arbit they, they're the the ones who decides what's nicely and not, um, you know, and giving the world the ultimate freedom, the freedom to agree with the U.S. and make sure you do it their way. I mean, if you choose anything else, that's, you know, <laughs> that, that that's another story. Um, but these are these are genocide promoters um, at the end of the day. They, they are because, you know, just as we've we've said, uh, look at the 21st century. Look at what the U.S. has demonstrably done on the on the global stage versus even the wildest accusations that they have made up about China. And, uh, you know, the thing about Xinjiang that that bothers me the most is when you're sitting there reading the BBC or, or anyone for that matter now, today, and how they're claiming this so-called genocide is is going on, even though it's not really because in the fine print, they say cultural genocide. Uh, but these very same media outlets used to kind of almost brag about how much chaos was going on in Xinjiang back when, when the separatists were really uh, carrying out their terrorist campaign. It was almost as if they were bragging, kind of like they, they do in other countries, to just show like how, how helpless 
and out of control the government is, how there's this huge crisis and there's nothing they can do about it. And, and to try to embarrass and humiliate the, the government, uh, they do that here in Thailand also. They, they pick a crisis and then they say, look, the, the, the Thai government can't handle it. They're, they're a bad government. The China, Chinese government is a bad government. They cannot contain this terrorism. And now that they have contained it, now the narrative has flipped completely around to where uh, there was no terrorism. They're just picking on the Uyghurs for no no apparent reason, no reason apparently, they're, just because they want to, I guess. And they are pissed that they've solved the issue. They are just, you know, if it was still in chaos, it goes to the same thing. It goes back to the same thing too. If China remained the factory of the world, if China remained in that state when you know factory workers were paid next to nothing to make the uh, products that are consumed in the West, helping the West live great lives because they can buy cheap electronics and components and, and household goods because somebody's slaving away in a factory in China for you. And China never ever, China's economy never ever got to the point where it was potentially going to challenge America's. Nobody would be talking about China. They'd be like, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it wouldn't matter what kinds of human rights abuses are going on in China. They would serve a purpose for America, just like Saudi Arabia does, just like Israel does. You know, their purpose is to make our cheap shit. And we don't really get involved in what kinds of human rights abuses are going on in places that are useful enough to us. We know that's the case. But China is just it's one win after another. They've uplifted their population. They've brought their population out of poverty, extreme poverty. They've solved the terrorism issue and they're on track to become one of the largest economies in the world. That is infuriating to people who speak like this Matthew guy who said, no, we everybody else is supposed to be living under our global order, which he basically says in his own words in this video. And, and it's, a, it's a very personal thing for them, too. It's not just about America. Like, like I said, it ties into their insecurity because I, I find that a lot of racist people are insecure and they attach their, their small starving ego to this, this larger thing. And uh, so it's a very personal thing. When they, when they see China succeeding and passing them by and they see the world starting to look up to China rather than to the West, which is, is a, cr it's a crumbling civilization because they have done this. Uh, and, and they want to double down on what has caused their, their fall here. And it's a very personal thing. They cannot, they cannot and they will not have China surpass them. So I think you said it in one of your videos where you were talking about people like Matt and how the, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan is so humiliating. It lays bare every lie, every, every atrocity, every negative aspect of U.S. foreign policy. And even as that debacle is unraveling in front of the whole world, they're already trying to channel it into this conflict that they're, they're trying to engineer with China. It's just unreal. And there's yeah. so many people buying into it. I mean, if you look at their audiences, I don't know how much of that is, is real or inflated, but I, I, I suspect there's a lot of really kind of racist, backwards thinking people in the West who cannot abide uh, a China, a non-white nation surpassing the West. I, I think that that is a real problem, even in the year 2021. And this is how they're going to recruit people to their cause. That and the fact that there is economic turmoil in the West. And when, when there's poverty and ignorance, uh, out comes extremism. Uh, and they right. will exploit that to the fullest extent. And this is what, this is what I fear. Yeah, it, it is. a. It, I think you're right. I mean, when you look through their comments, uh, it definitely supports your uh, theory of um, this being uh, people who um, are either, you know, outright racists or they perhaps are racist without even realizing it, that this is about us making sure that there aren't non-white people that, you know, uh, reach a, a level of affluence greater than ours. Um, it's, you know, these people, like you said, that attach themselves to something bigger. They themselves are nobodies. They have um, confidence issues or whatever it is, but at least they've got an American passport in their hands. And that means something because we subjugate the rest of the world to our order and our rules. And as that's slipping around, they're left with nothing now. They're nothing. How could they possibly survive in a world where brown or, you know, any color other than white is on top? I mean, that must be a real a shock to somebody who uh, 
either was, you know, outright racist or had those kinds of tendencies underneath. I mean, I think a lot of it's manufactured by the media also, too, where um, the entire industry, I mean, uh, Hollywood, media, all of this stuff, they, they do a good job of convincing people that this is the way you should think. So I have a feeling that a lot of these people who have these tendencies wouldn't have had them naturally on their own, but it's been cultivated in the environment that they grew up in that says, yeah, we, we should be on top. We are the superheroes. You know, we all grow up with all, all the superheroes are American super superheroes. When, you know, Independence Day comes along and the aliens are coming, it's going to be the Americans who save us. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, people need to get out of that and actually start realizing that their problems have always been closer to home. Their enemy is at home. You know, if, if, if American hegemony over the world actually benefited the ordinary American, I would almost understand this cognitive dissonance, this complacency a little bit more. But the thing is, it doesn't. The wealth transfers that happen during these conflicts don't benefit the ordinary American. They benefit a small elite at the top, and the people in the bottom are still waiting for this trickle-down economics to work as the wealth gap continues to increase, as poverty continues to increase, and they're continually being told that it's because their problems are elsewhere. I, I mean, it's a back; it's completely backwards. I, I mean, everything everything that a, a human being needs, you know, healthcare, education, housing; these are all things that that Americans don't have easy access to. Healthcare, especially. I mean, I was shocked when I left the U.S. and I came here to Thailand. I'm able to pay for all my. I, I'm not covered under Thai universal healthcare. My family is, but I'm not because I'm not Thai. But I can still pay out of my pocket for for healthcare here because every all the prices are low. They like they went deliberately went out of the way to reduce healthcare prices to as low as possible. And this is just something that is completely alien in the U.S. And I mean, these are basic things that Americans need and they do not have. And the, and the Western media is great at supplying excuses as to why that is. Just like you say, it's, it's mostly a blame game or they're trying to say, well, look at the U.K. or look at Canada. Their, their, their healthcare system doesn't work. But they never point at a country where it actually does work because they, they were able to get the, the big pharma lobby under control or thrown out completely. They never talk about those things. Uh, just one more point I want to kind of touch on with pe people like Matt and the others, these anti-China, and, and they all swear up and down they're not racist and they don't hate Chinese people. But like I said, I, as a kid growing up, I, I heard all of the, the racist tricks and, and smoke and mirrors. And one of the things they like to do when you try to argue with them about uh, you know, black people have invented stuff, Asian people have invented stuff. They'll always try to make it out as if somehow that was only possible because they either stole the, the technology from white people or somehow they were educated by white people or somehow benefited from white civilization. This is one of their, this is something that is like a very old racist trope. And I hear them doing it with co companies like Huawei where they're like, oh, Huawei is not a real successful company. They just stole everything from the US. Everything yeah. China does is Their stolen. 5G came before R1, but it's because they they traveled back from the future. <laughs> exactly. Some, something like that. And yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, it's very obvious that this is, this is a very kind of pillar in this entire argument is this, this racism that they won't talk about. They'll constantly deny it. Uh, but I think it's important to point that out because... You're trying to sell an international order, but what it sounds like is it's just old, tired imperialism. And we already know what that looks like and how it ends. So why are you selling yeah. that? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the process of reading another book also uh, by, from somebody from my mother's country of Guyana in South America, Walter Rodney, um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And it talks about the vibrant trade and the, the systems in place they had that were far beyond Europe. Um, you know, the, the quality of the textiles and all of this stuff was better than what they were getting, what, what was being produced in Europe. And then you go forward to um, uh, the, the British Empire coming through India and basically de-industrializing their country, destroying their textile industry, even banning their textiles from being allowed in Britain as they try to get a foot up. You know, clearing out land to grow uh, opium that was going to be shipped to China. Um, you know, Winston Churchill uh, uh, the policies that led directly to famine that killed millions of people. And then you've got somebody like Winston Sturzel, 
who always wants to talk about Mao and the, the famine that occurred during the Great Leap Forward and how many deaths he's responsible for while he's naming his custom motorcycle company um, uh, Churchill Customs because he idolizes Winston Churchill. Uh, it, 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 it's it's a crazy uh, you know uh, uh, double standard that's going on. Let me point something out here too, because China China has made missteps in its past, and China oh, is the yeah. first one to to admit that they've done that. And if you look at the China that was doing that uh, before the turn of the century, and the China today, they are two completely different things. When you look at the the UK, the British Empire, and you look at the the Anglo American. Uh, rules-based international order, which is really just the same same exact thing. It has never changed. All it has done is update the lies and the propaganda. They have modern weaponry. They are doing the exact same thing that they were doing to India, to Africa, to South America. What the British were doing to the, the colonies in America, this is, this is what they're doing today. They haven't changed. So they're, they're trying to, they're trying to point at China's history and ignore the fact that they have reformed and that they're pursuing a completely different path than, than what led to those missteps. And then they're, they're looking at their own history and they're failing to acknowledge that it's just the same thing, a continuity of agenda. Um, and uh, one sec, sorry, one second, I got somebody. You're right. Um, and the uh, acknowledging the uh, the, 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 they're not only not acknowledging history, they're continuing to celebrate it. I just want to add one point uh, about the, uh, the, the, the point about the history of China, but give me one second. I just got to reply to something here. Um, I have something arriving at home, which sure, has sure. A, take a, your time. Cause you, like you said, you can, you can cut it out if you have to. So don't worry about it. Take your time. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I, I still got, I still got a, I still got plenty of time over here. So don't worry. Good, good, good. Uh, all right. No, that's good. That's good. I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I had something arriving that had some duty that needed to be paid. I just need to confirm. So um, one thing that, I mean, there's, whole, there's so many layers about how people twist history to suit their um, narrative also. And one thing that's often left out is that during the, 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 the reset of, uh, of China, when all of these things happened, all of these different um, – uh, terrible missteps also during the cultural revolution, the land reforms and things like that. But at the same time, there were, there was an Indian uh, science uh, or a researcher. I can't remember his name. What he did was he looked at um, the reforms that took place during all of these kind of cultural revolution, great leap forward, because there was a reset where land was taken back from powerful landlords. It was redistributed. Everybody had a piece of land. There were certain social mechanisms that got put in place and stuff like that. And so when you look at the famine and some of the biggest numbers, uh, if you take some of the biggest uh, inflated number. Some of them go up to 30 million. I think some of them, they're trying to make it even bigger now. And you want to put that all on Mao and you don't want to consider any of the environmental factors or anything like that, because certainly some of Mao's uh, policies are, are contributed towards that. When you look at the position that they came out of that, that Deng, Deng Xiaoping could then build on after that reset and you compare it to somewhere like India, um, which is a good comparison, he said, because in the post kind of uh, old way of colonialism, after that happened, both the population of India and China were at similar positions. Um, their you know, economy was at similar positions. The amount of people that die in India from not having their own plot of land or not having the same social services that are available in China uh, throughout a, 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 a major period, every seven years amounted to 30 million people. So people don't want to take a step back and say this reset that had to happen, certainly things could have been done better. There must have been a better way to do things. But that reset that happened uh, created the conditions that allowed China to thrive now. And I don't want to get that into too much. That's almost like a whole episode by itself. But yes, my point, my point, <laughs> my point, yeah, my point of saying is that people selectively look at history to create the narrative that they want while very ironically celebrating their own uh, kind of elements that are still going on today. You know, when you talk about China, they say, what about 1989? What about the Tiananmen Square protests and stuff like that? You've got, they've got to go 30 years back to, to use their own version of what about is. And when you're talking about modern day 
um, uh, imperialism here. And let, let's not even get into the fact that they're com they completely have no idea about the full story of Tiananmen Square to begin with. But that's how far yeah. they've got to go back to try to hold on to their view of uh, th this world. Um, and it's it's I, I got to be honest, it's just kind of pathetic. I don't think there's a better word for it. It is because while they're talking about Mao, who's been dead for decades, uh, the U.S. is currently right now occupying eastern Syria. They're still in Iraq. They won't leave Iraq. They, they've officially left Afghanistan, but we know that, that, that it's not over. They're going to continue creating chaos, death, and destruction in, in Afghanistan. They've, uh, they've promised they're going to do over-the-horizon drone strikes, which we know kill uh, nine out of ten people killed in these strikes are innocent civilians, have nothing to do with terrorism. Or, or whatever the U.S. is accusing the, the actual target of. And this is what the U.S. is doing right now. Not last century, uh, not a decade ago, not two decades ago. It's what they're doing right, right now. Right. China's not doing that. No one else is doing that right now. The U.S. and its allies are doing that right now. And uh, so when people give these flowery, um, you know, these, these platitudes about what the U.S. is doing in the world today, he has to be very, very general and ambiguous about his language, because if he had to get specific, he would have to face all of these these actual facts. And he cannot, because then his whole argument falls apart. And what, what sort of people indulge in these sort of narratives? These are people who don't care what the truth is. They they right. want to hear what they want to hear. They, they, they listen to him because he's telling them what they want to hear. Right. Not because That's he's actually key. informing them. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that one of the keys that you honed in on is like they're focusing on Mao. Mao's gone. Mao, Mao has been gone for a while. And you have Americans who are alive today who are war criminals, who, you know, drone strike children, who uh, architect, who, who, who built wars on packs of lies knowingly. They weren't given mistaken information. They didn't make a mistake. They knowingly lied to people to excuse a war that killed many many civilians and these people are still okay nobody's going after them they're saying well, well no we have to get to mao first mao's gone you've got living war criminals in your country that has not been held accountable like what do you again it's what people want to hear uh but it's the mental gymnastics that are involved in this are just like gold medal winning level stuff we're seeing here and, and this is why this is why I'm compelled to do what I'm doing. I think it's what compels you and, and many people out there because it, it could be a, a very thankless job, but you have to just keep out keep, keep putting this information out, showing this. Uh, you, I think we I think we do win over some people. And then for other people who are kind of they kind of know something is wrong, but you're help you're helping uh, give them the information so they can fully understand it and they can help maybe participate in exposing it and resisting it because you know like the, the us is not going to just one day wake up and say ah okay you're right multipolarism is better uh no they're not they're not going to do that they're going to go to the bitter end a, a lot of them feel like they have nothing to lose I and mean, we we look at empire all throughout history that they they often do go right over the cliff, the, you know, oblivious. And, and I don't know if it's arrogance or, or self-delusion or what it is, but, but they are going to continue doing this. And in the process, real people's lives are going to be destroyed. I, I'm in a country that has been targeted by this. I've, I've watched the destruction unfold with my, my own eyes. And uh, I, when I see it happening in other countries, I, I can relate to it. And I, it's just something, if you can somehow prevent it or mitigate it, even in the slightest bit, if you could just even by one degree less, I, I think it's worth it's worth doing. And if you don't do it, you'll just say to yourself, what if you what if you did do it and it made a difference? So, yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of what uh, drives each of us, I mean, there's so many different things that went into into my story. But I'm going to save that for when I'm on your channel, because we're going to do we're going to do one of these on your channel afterwards. Yes. Um, but I but I do want to say that there's obviously the additional risk of um, this empire that is in panic mode uh, undeniably in panic mode um when you consider you know thucydides traps and the and the whole dynamic of when a, a superpower takes over another uh, superpower um you consider that the last thing that america has to hold on to is that they have one of the most powerful militaries in the world um with bases all over the world we're in a really i mean we're in a situation where people should start feeling nervous about what they're going to do next 
Um, they're desperate. They're clearly desperate. You know, three hundred million dollars per year just in propaganda to fight against, you know, China's Belt and Road initiatives. I mean, what 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 kind of a manic kind of a, a state do you need to be in to be doing this kind of stuff? And so the the chance of this leading into a war um, that is on a scale like we've never seen before, even if it isn't the intention of anybody right now, but happens to become the result of one small misstep or one small mistake, is something that is um, remotely possible, but uh, something that is so would be so devastating that I think we really need to start paying attention. And if you want to just listen to lies and you you just you're listening to what you uh, what you want to hear at least be aware let us let, hear us out let us tell you this is what's really want to really what's going on but if you want to go back in your cave afterwards after you've learned the truth fine but people should at least have the opportunity to know about it because a lot of people don't know about it a lot of people don't really don't know what's going on um, but we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit more when I come on your show about what, 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 when I come on your show about what drives me, I'm going to finish with one very short clip from the same video from Matthew time, because he has the nerve to mention Vietnam when he says this, and you just gotta, you gotta hear it yourself. Here we go. Every country in the world was supposed to have a shot at success. The American dream style. And now in 2021, whether you're in Poland or Vietnam or Botswana or Colombia, you benefit from the American-led order. That's the simple truth. What do you think about that simple truth there? I, what, I, I don't even know. What, what does he actually mean? What do you think he means he by means, that? He means that you made a mistake leaving the American military. You were a force. You, the, the military is a, 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 a force for a good in, this, in, good in this world that's making everybody's lives better, including Vietnam, where they kicked Americans' asses out, and they were left with birth defects to this day from Agent Orange, and they're left with 800,000 tons of unexploded ordnance and landmines in their mountains, and Laos even more, which is still blowing off the arms and legs of children, because that's how they benefited from... America's <laughs> world order. And, and, and you know, like, because Southeast Asia is kind of my specialty. I, I, I have been to Laos uh, several times and I've, I've passed through it before, the, the Ch before China, not the United States, built highways, cutting the trip from three, three days through winding mountains to one day over a modern highway. And now they're, they're almost done with the high speed rail. And, uh, the, the, and with Vietnam, if you look at the entire region, their largest trade partner, investor, infrastructure partner is China, not the United States. Even Vietnam, which has had a rocky relationship with China as well. Uh, when Kamala Harris came to Vietnam and she was talking about, hey, join us. And, you know, look at the numbers. China is Vietnam's largest trade partner. So, so when Kamala Harris says, hey, join us in confronting this bully, China. It's like saying, hey, push your, your business partner down the stairs, the guy who helps you uh, stay in business and feed your family, push him down the stairs with us. And, and even Vietnam had to talk to China diplomatically and say, no, we're not going to do that. It was inappropriate for her to say this. We, didn't, we, don't, con we don't condone her saying this on our territory. And it just goes to show you this is the true face of American empire, and we don't even have to come out and, and say it. Kamala Harris, with her own mouth, said it uh, on Vietnamese territory, trying to force Vietnam to, to, to pick a side in, in, in side picking that Vietnam doesn't benefit from. The US is a large export market. So is China. They want to protect both export markets. A country coming in and saying, you need to pick is exactly like what, what he claimed. Oh, as long as you don't do business with the Soviet Union. Well, now it's as long as you don't do business with China. Uh, and like you, like you said, there's, they're still feeling the impact from the Vietnam War. Right. There's, there's more I, unexploded it, ordnance in Laos than people living there. You know, you know, you know, when um, when when uh, some British NGOs actually went in to try to disarm some of this, these uh, unexploded ordnance and landmines in Laos, the U.S. the U.S. wasn't sending anybody at that point. They weren't. They weren't doing. They didn't have anything to do with the cleanup that was blowing off the arms and legs of children. Not only that, they refused to release the schematics to this British NGO to disarm these landmines. 
because they were state secrets. They were military secrets. Like, like, I mean, what, what is going on? I mean, that Thailand story is interesting. They showed up hoping that Thailand would be as stupid as Australia. Sorry, Australia. I know I've got a lot of viewers from Australia. But, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, and I know this it sounds kind of cliche or like, you know, it, you know, people talk about racism uh, so much that it, 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 in some cases they've taken it a little bit too far. But at the end of the day, I really think it has to do with the fact with Australia, they have the benefit that... Australia looks more like the people in America and they'd be like, well, yeah, of course we're going to team up with these guys. You know, there is a, there is a racial component here with the five eyes Alliance. And I, I think some of that edge is taken off. Some of that advantage is taken off with Vietnam saying, well, well hold on a second. Um, not only do they not have that constraint where divides can be uh, developed between people who don't look like, who look, who don't look anything like you, but also they have the history, of course, about what America did in Vietnam and they haven't paid, they haven't paid out anything to these people who are suffering from the ongoing effects of agent orange that were dropped on their heads. Um, I mean, it's not surprising that uh, they they were like, no, nah, we're, we're not going to play ball with this, but the propaganda piece that's going to come in afterwards is going to be really hard to contend with because America does propaganda really, really well. And when you go around to these countries and you look at the uh, opinion polls on how they feel about China, it is directly related to these propaganda efforts. America wouldn't yeah. be spending $300 million per year on anti-China propaganda if they didn't think it could actually affect the opinions of people. And it does. It is directly, it it is directly related to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, here, the universities in Thailand, and, you know, this is something that I, you know, for, for Thai people, it's their business to, to handle it how they want to. But I, you know, I, I try to put the idea out there that it needs, that this country needs a much stronger national security law. The U.S. infiltrates the universities, the, the, the student unions. Uh, there's this one guy named Netowit who swears he's not working for the U.S., but uh, he was working with uh, the Uyghur... Human Rights Project. They hosted them at the Thai University. And, you know, he goes, again, just like you were saying, he goes to the Chinese embassy every single year uh, on the anniversary of the, the Tiananmen Square incident. And he protests in front of the, the Chinese embassy. And I, I'm just wondering, you're doing that about something that happened before you were even born, because he wasn't even alive in 1989. What about the US embassy? Why don't you go there and protest the ongoing atrocities taking place right now, right now as, as you live and breathe. The US is doing horrible things to people all over the globe. Why aren't you there protesting? Show some consistency. And it's because he's, he's, been bought, he's bought into this Western propaganda where, where China is evil, and this is the cause of our generation is to, to stop evil China uh, and just live your life oblivious to the abuses that the U.S. is, well, is doing versus I mean, what yeah, they're even, claiming China's doing. Yeah, e even above and beyond that, at home, like how about you stand up for the, the the Vietnamese people who are still having babies born with birth defects because they're in these zones that had Agent Orange dropped on them? Like, why aren't you in protesting in front of the U.S. embassy to get them to come and clean up their unexploded ordinance that's scattered all over your country? Like, what? Well, where? where you want you want to protest you you want to protest something that happened 30 years ago that has nothing to do with you while aligning with groups that are funded by the US who still have unexploded ordnance sitting all over your country and who are affecting the the, the future generations of Vietnamese people well this was this is net to it. he's a he's a thai student uh, activist so he's not even from vietnam he's not from oh, okay. china and he's going to the Chinese embassy in Bangkok, Thailand to protest about Tiananmen Square before he was even born while there's all these things happening right now. And, and right, right, right. But that's, still, that's still relevant because the U.S. hasn't cleaned up any of, any of the mess it made during, during the Vietnam War, including in Laos and in Cambodia. And so there's that past that people are still suffering from today, plus the things the U.S. is doing today that people will be suffering from for uh, decades from now. I mean, the cluster bombs, depleted uranium that they're dumping all over battlefields from, from North Africa to Central Asia. This is, this is going to be a, a legacy of death, destruction, deformities that people are, are going to suffer for generations to come. And so why is he not talking about that? Because he, he, he was approached, they put him on the front uh, or, or maybe in a Time Magazine article and he's been totally bought off his ego. He has attached his ego to this. And you know, once you do that, it's very hard to admit you were wrong and to do the right thing. So he's just going to double down when you see what these people end up like in their, you know, 
when they get older in their middle ages or when they get much older, I, they, you know, they've lost their humanity and they've just become these, these willing tools of foreign interests, just ravaging their own country. And they, they don't even care. They don't care and you can't talk to them. And, and they know what they're doing. At that point, they know what they're doing. Someone like Netowit though, he probably knows what he's doing right yeah. now. He knows because he could read me saying it and he's like on Twitter, I'm not on Twitter anymore. I've been deleted, but he'll he'll respond to to you know a video that I do, or people accusing him of these things, and and he'll respond, and he knows what he's doing. He knows it, Tw and he's just Twitter removed to... your tw Twitter removed you, or yeah, yes, Twitter and Facebook on the exact same day removed all of my accounts, my stuff for geopolitics and my personal stuff too. So like under under my name, uh, like industrial design stuff like there was a website where i, I was showing about proj a project that i was doing with a local children's hospital where i, I used 3d printing to like they on the spot yeah they shut everything down yeah and deleted it all on the same day that's why i came out because i, I felt like they had to know what my real life they it wasn't an algorithm yeah. it was a it was an investigation and they shut everything down wow Wow. Yeah. That is remarkable. I've got some stories of people being shut down also, but what we'll do is maybe we'll save some topics for when we're over on your channel. Uh, this okay. was an amazing talk. I'm finally, I'm glad we finally managed to connect. Um, but uh, uh, Brian, maybe we'll wrap it up here and offline we'll talk about when we will connect on your channel. And I, I hope we can collaborate a little bit more. We're uh, on the same wavelength with a lot of this stuff. And I think we could uh, definitely um, assist each other with getting the truth out there. Yes, and thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. You know, I've been following your your work for a, a long time now, and uh, you know, it's it's really great that we're able to collaborate like this. So, thank you again. I'm, uh, absolutely, I'm really happy about it. Also, and so I will leave the links to your uh, YouTube channel. YouTube channel is now called uh, the uh, the New Atlas, is it? The New Atlas, yes. The new the new Atlas. Okay, I'll put that down in the description, and if you have a blog or anything like that, I'll put it down there too. But uh, we will connect next time on your channel. Thanks for joining me, and thanks everyone for uh, staying with us for so long. Thank Take you. Take care.